As one year draws to a close, another begins. A constant in human existence is the paranormal. Almost all of us will experience something that we cannot explain at some point in our lives. There will always be paranormal accounts to tell. Before we enter a new chapter of real paranormal stories, let us reflect upon some of the inexplicable encounters and experiences that you shared in the past 12 months. So, sit back and enjoy some of the most intriguing real paranormal stories of 2017. While I have always been fascinated by the paranormal, nothing paranormal ever really happened to me until I turned 14. In the spring of that year, I lived in a small town in Tennessee in America. One morning, I had a terrible nightmare. In the nightmare, my mother, father, and my father's brother went to a department store. The parking lot was empty, and it was over a river. I couldn't see it, but I knew that it was there, because the parking lot was very thin. I was afraid of the river, because I cannot swim. At the bank, near the parking lot, there was a bush with a tree growing out of it. For some reason, the strange bush tree stuck out in my mind. In the department store, we couldn't find what we were looking for. When we left the store and got into the car, I remember feeling panic. My mother was driving, and she drove forward instead of backward. We went into the river. I dreamt that the car was filling up with water. I was terrified. I knew that I was going to drown. All the while, my dad kept yelling, Don't worry, we're going to be okay. He lowered the windows, so he and my mother were able to exit the car. My uncle and I were in the back seat. We did the same. I remember the water was very muddy. I could just about see the light through the water as I swam towards the surface. I was almost there when, suddenly, something grabbed my right foot. I looked down. It was my uncle. He was pulling me down, deeper into the water. With that, I screamed and woke up. That whole week I was very upset by the dream. It had been more real than any dream I had ever had before. I told my teachers and friends about the dream. I was that terrified. I had the dream on the Monday. By Friday, I was feeling better. In fact, I had almost forgotten about it at that point. After school that day, I went to my neighbor's house and was talking with them when my mom came and got me. She looked panicked. It was then that she told me that there had been an emergency. My uncle, a different uncle from the dream, was missing. My uncle Jimmy, his son, and his son's friend had gone fishing together. My uncle had been in his boat, whilst my cousin and his friend were using my cousin's boat. Sometime during the trip, the second boat lost sight of the first. Eventually, they found my Uncle Jimmy's boat. However, he himself was nowhere to be seen. Fearing the worst, the sheriff organized a team of divers and dragged the river. During that week, I didn't go to school. At this point, we didn't have any hope of finding him alive. My mum and I stayed at my aunt's house, while my dad went to the river to help them search the woods. On the Sunday, my mum and I went to the river to help with the searching ourselves. It was the first time I had ever been there. There was a gravel road that sloped down to the riverbank, and I refused to be in the car when my mum parked it. She let me out and I walked down the hill. There were a lot of people gathered, with porta potties and tables of food laid out for all those involved in the search. My mum and I decided to sit by the river on a large rock, and that's when I saw it. By the riverbank, there was a bush with a tree growing out of it. The same one from my dream. I immediately began to freak out. I told my mom about the tree, and began spluttering about my dream, trying to refresh her memory of what I had told her only a few days before. I felt like she wasn't listening to me. She wanted me to calm down. She thought that I was making a scene and being disrespectful of the situation. So, for now. I held my tongue. 
Later that day, my dad and I had to use the restroom. We didn't want to use the porta potties because people were gathered near them and getting food from the tables. So we walked up the hill by the river. At the top of the hill, there was a thin slab of concrete on the ground with a metal rod sticking out of it. All of a sudden, I felt sick. That awful, sinking feeling that you feel when you've been caught doing something you shouldn't be washed over me. I stood on the concrete. To my left, there was a cliff over the river. The tree branches were thin, and I told my dad, they're going to find him soon. I pointed to the clearing in the river. Right there. When they find him, they'll find his right shoe. My dad came over and hit my hand. He said not to tell anyone what I had just told him, and that I should be ashamed. The next day, divers found my uncle's right shoe. My dad had told them to check the spot I had pointed to. When they found my uncle's body, he was wearing a cotton overall. It was believed that when it filled up with water, he had lacked the strength to swim to the surface. After this happened, I became convinced that I had some sort of gift. I had known where they would find my uncle, and had dreamt of the river that would claim his life. I had seen the future and would continue to do so from then on. Many years ago, I worked the night shift as a security guard. On that particular night, I had left early, so it was around 2am in the morning. The road I travelled on, although a main road, was surrounded by countryside on both sides. In the daytime, you could see farmers' fields for miles and miles. Then, I could only see the reflection of my car's lights on the tarmac. I remember it was a clear night. As usual, the road was empty of other cars. So, when I came around a corner to see a car blocking the road, I was surprised. The driver's door was wide open, and its lights were on. At first, I thought it had crashed. Only when I stopped did I see a man standing by the gateway into a field. He was just standing there staring into the darkness. I saw nothing. Then, as if from nowhere, a bright light beamed into the field. The light was intense and pencil thin. As I got out the car and approached the man, he shouted, Did you see that? He pointed across the field to a far hedgerow to where the light was. Almost as soon as the light appeared, it went out. However, there was no residue, no fade as the light absorbed into the blackness of the night. It just disappeared perfectly, unnaturally. My heart pounded, confused at what I was seeing. Within a matter of moments, the light was back, once again intense and pencil thin. Once again, it disappeared suddenly without residue. Both me and the man stood there in awe. This happened four or five more times before the light disappeared for good. It was a very still night, with no sounds or movement for miles. Neither one of us could make sense of what we had just witnessed. A couple of days later, I saw a strange report in the local newspaper. There had been dozens of sightings of brighter lights in the sky that same night I stopped at the field, including reports from personnel at Royal Air Force bases. They claimed to have seen a craft flying at about 200 feet, which fired a narrow beam of light which swept the ground. Since that day, no one has been able to explain what I and many others saw that night. All I know is that it will stay with me forever. I am a paranormal investigator and medium. The dead do not scare me. I often find them to be much more trustworthy, and often more fun than the living. After all, they don't have much to lose, considering they already have. Without a doubt, the living can inflict more harm than any spirit can, but that's a story for another time. I was 22 years old when my mom and I and the paranormal investigative team we were members of took part in a charity event. It was put on by a historical society at a charming turn-of-the-century house. For the event, we set up stations where people could experiment with the investigative equipment. 
It was a pretty sweet deal, considering we enjoyed working with scientific alongside spiritual methods, and not just one or the other. The visitors to the event really got the best of both worlds. It was night and I was sitting in one of the bedrooms, speaking with people as they came in and out, hoping to experience something paranormal. They were disappointed, as nothing was really happening. That was when I saw her. She was a tall, thin, intense looking woman. She wore a white dress and her hair was piled high. I had never been to this house before and had no idea who this lady was. She sat on the bed, glaring at me. She was upset that people were coming into her bedroom so late at night. She kept saying that she wanted to get some sleep, but the people wouldn't leave her alone. When I see spirits, I see them in my head, almost like you would see an imaginary friend. Only, they're not imaginary, they are real. I asked the woman what her name was, and she told me it was Ruth. I explained to her that if she went to the third floor, she could get some sleep, since no one was allowed up there. After that, she left the room. Ruth. The name stuck in my head, the way peanut butter sticks to the roof of your mouth. Her face, too, stayed in my mind. I could not shake her. Even though I described myself as a medium, when I first saw spirits, it was a battle for my sanity. Am I really seeing these things, or do I just need to up my meds? Shaken, I asked the other investigators if they had seen her. No one had. Just me. Desperate to determine whether or not I had invented the whole thing, I went to the ladies who ran the Historical Society for help. Someone had to know who Ruth was, maybe they would know. I gave them a description, and even drew a picture of her, hoping it would help them in their search. They offered to look for her in their records, so I left them to it. I returned to the investigation, trying to push Ruth from my mind. Questions, including why she was haunting the house, kept returning to my mind. Was she attached to the house? Something in the house? It was sometime after midnight when the event wrapped up. We packed up and began putting everything in our cars, when the two ladies who ran the historical society approached me. Their faces were as white as sheets. We found her, they said, trembling. They handed me an old newspaper clipping they had found. It described an anniversary of the historical society, and amongst the photographs was a picture of the men and women who owned the house. Now it was my turn to be as white as a sheet. My jaw dropped, and my stomach flipped as I stared into the face of the woman from the bedroom. In the photograph, she was tall and thin, her hair piled high, and her eyes intense. Her name was Ruth Gibberson. I felt a combination of shock and relief. Since that time, I have never doubted myself again. I stick to my gut and draw whatever I see. Because of this, my abilities have grown, and it is much easier to now draw those spirits that I see. I come from a small town in the heart of Serbia. The house I grew up in had belonged to my father for many years, and for most of my childhood had brought our family nothing but happy memories. However, about four years ago, things began to happen in that place that I just could not explain. One evening, I was outside taking pictures of my home. I was standing underneath our wooden gazebo, the garden to my side, facing the house. It wasn't until afterwards that I realized my camera had captured something strange. It was a glimmer of light hovering over the roof. If I had to describe it as anything, I would describe it as an orb. At first, I thought it was an anomaly with a camera flash. I had taken other photos from the same position, and nothing. A few of my friends said it was probably just dust, so I soon forgot about the photo. Last year, my sister and I made a special gift for our mom's birthday. It was a jar which we had decorated 
and filled with 50 notes saying why she was the best mom. Anyway, she loved it and placed it somewhere that she would always see it, on top of the TV in her bedroom. One day sometime afterwards, while my mom was ironing, she heard a loud and sudden bang. She turned and saw that the jar had moved. It was no longer on top of the TV. It was on the shelf directly beneath it. She was a bit spooked, but put the jar back and left the room. A couple of days passed before a similar incident occurred. She was walking through the room when it happened. Only, this time, my mom saw it. She said that she saw the jar being pushed off the TV, do a flip, and then, almost like someone moved it midair, land perfectly on the shelf. She could not explain what she had seen. So, scared as she was, she refused to touch the jar. Later, I put the jar back on the TV and waited for it to happen again, but nothing did. To this day, my mom refuses to keep the jar on top of the TV. By now, I was seriously beginning to question what was happening in my house. It was then that my dad told me about something truly terrifying, which had happened to him some 20 years before, when he was about 20 years old, before he married my mom. Every night when he lay down in his bed in that house, he would be haunted by three loud knocks. Just as he was drifting off to sleep, he would hear it. A single sharp knock. A pause. And then another two knocks. The knocks sounded as though they were coming from outside of the house, but there was never anything there. Yet, each night when my dad was alone in bed, just before he fell asleep, these same three knocks would beat out against the wall. The inexplicable sounds continued for about a year, until the time came for my dad to go into the army. In my country, it is mandatory to spend a year in the army, if only for training in times of peace. When my dad came back home, whatever had been causing the knocking had gone, and the noises with it. My dad was never able to explain the source of those knocks. I cannot help but wonder whether that thing, whatever it was, truly ever left, or whether it remained in that house, and remains still to this day. I encountered them when I was in missionary school in Hawaii. I joined right after graduating high school, thinking that I might experience something which would help me to decide my future and my faith. The school organized a great variety of lectures and classes, as well as taking students on missionary trips across the globe. I seemed so certain of myself at the time, but I know now that I was not ready for what was waiting for me. My sister had gone through the Southeast Asia evangelism course before me. She was always cheerful and smiling, a role model to me. I wanted to follow her footsteps. However, when I told her that I had volunteered to help people in Southeast Asia, as she had done, she looked worried. She told me that it was something to take seriously. It was like she wanted to say more, but left it at that for now. For the next two weeks I attended lectures and cultural awareness classes in preparation for the trip. One night, my sister called me to meet her in the prayer room, as it would be quiet there and give us some privacy. My sister worked at the school as a member of staff by this time, so we hung out a lot, during which we'd chat and she'd give me advice. I figured that our meeting would be one of those sessions. When I arrived, she was sitting quietly in the dark room, praying to an opened Bible in the low candlelight. She did not even notice me as I walked in. Sensing the heaviness of the atmosphere, I instantly realized that she didn't call me just to have a conversation or a friendly prayer together. Something was wrong. I could hear her sobbing. After a while, she greeted me, wiping tears out of her eyes. I could see her face glimmering in the candlelight. When you see a person crying, you can usually tell the motive of the sadness. Why my sister was crying, I did not know. Thousands of questions were in my head, but I didn't dare to ask her. She was terrified. I mean absolutely terrified, 
enough to feel her shaking from a distance. She was trying her best not to show her fear to me, but it was obvious. My sister then told me to sit, which I did. A moment of silence passed between us before she spoke. Do you really need to go there? She asked. Go where? I asked back. I could see her face covered in fear again. Missionary trip, she responded plainly. I then realized that her fear was due to the trip, which she had taken prior to me. Her fear did not make sense to me though. She always seemed happy and willing to share her experience of the trip to anyone who asked, never scared. In that moment, she was terrified. She really did not want me to go, and not because of petty reasons like missing me and those sorts of things. I was leaving for Cambodia in a week's time and would be gone for five months. The trip would take me to Cambodia, Thailand, Malaysia and Indonesia. I calmly asked her why she did not want me to go, but she did not speak. She was choked with emotion, covering her eyes and holding back more tears. Finally, shaking and her hands making a fist, she began, Look, wh when you go, when you go. I remember encouraging her to finish her sentence, but she never did. She ended the conversation by saying, Just be careful in Thailand, okay? She gave me a hug. I could feel her body was chilled. Even her tears, which now wetted my own cheeks, were cold. Over the next week, I asked my sister probably more than a hundred times to tell me more, but she refused to talk to me about it. On the day I left for Cambodia, she texted me the following words, When you see them, they see you. Them was a word often used in lectures to refer to evil beings, devils. Unnerved, I asked her what she meant by the message. She responded with an instruction, laced with fear. Pretend you do not see them. I laughed it off, even showing it to my buddy who was sitting next to me. We both laughed together, but I did save the text to my phone. My experience in Cambodia was amazing. I worked as a Korean lecturer, since Korean drama was very popular on the TV. I had my hands quite full, working and teaching people. Looking back now, I was definitely enjoying such a life, and was happy. It was exactly what I had hoped for the trip. But that experience did not last long when I heard we were being transferred to Thailand. We were going to be helping to build a church while staying in a motel owned by a private owner. My co-workers were happy about it, but all I could think about was my sister's final words to me and her text messages which she sent on the day I left. Just be careful in Thailand, okay? All I could see was her terrified face. I wished she had never said anything. I remember hating her for it at one point, as it unnerved me and was threatening to ruin the whole trip. After 16 long hours on a bus, we finally reached the motel we would be staying at in Thailand. It was an old wooden building, with lights run by loud generators installed at the back of the house. The building was shaped like the letter L, with the rooms divided by a hallway. In the middle of the motel was a shrine. It was a common shrine that Asian people worshipped every morning, clapping their hands and bowing their heads and such. I did not pay much attention to it, as I was more eager to find out if this building was safe, as it looked like it might collapse any minute and crush us to death. Our missionary work was to help build the church, which was about 10 minutes away from the motel. In the evening, we would relax, pray, and share messages. Three days passed without event. The whole time my guard was up because of my sister's words. I slept well due to the exhaustion of the physical work during the daytime. However, on the fourth day, I started feeling strange. I felt goosebumps when working, despite being covered in sweat from the heat and labour. I got a really big headache and had to take time out, sitting down with some water. I did not feel better. My leader told me my face looked terribly pale and I was probably being affected by the heat. They said I should probably head back to the motel and get some rest. I felt bad for leaving the work so early, but everyone seemed concerned and encouraged me to head back. So I started to walk down the road towards the motel, which stood at the end of the road. We were the only people staying at the motel, so during the day it was practically empty. It was incredibly quiet. 
too quiet. There was something about the atmosphere that I cannot explain, a quietness that tells you something is off. As soon as I stepped into the hallway, I noticed the shrine, and a person standing in front of it. The person was a girl, dressed in what seemed to be a white school uniform. She had her head bowed before the shrine. I thought she was the daughter of the motel owner. As it was a business relationship, he did not talk to us, and we did not talk to him. Therefore, I had no reason to talk to her. I just started to walk down to my room, still looking at the girl in the middle of the yard. Then, I noticed something. Her head, bowed before the shrine, did not come back up. At first, I thought she was praying with her head down, but as I walked along the hallway, passing the shrine, I realized that her posture was a bit… off. Her bowed head seemed strange to me, as though she had some kind of injury or disability. The angle of her bowed head was not normal. I slowed down to observe if anything was wrong. It was then that I saw it. Head to her shoulder, shoulder to her body, body to her legs, legs to her toes. One straight line, and swinging. Her feet were off the ground, hanging. Her entire body was swinging front and back slightly in front of the shrine. My heart stopped and I was frozen. I immediately realized that she, it, was not from this earth. And that is all I remember. The next thing I remember was being woken up in a room surrounded by my team, asking if I was alright. They told me that they had found me collapsed in the middle of the hallway. I was distressed, and still had a massive headache. The next day I was not able to go to the church. I just about managed to get up from my bed to look at the shrine from my room's window, wondering if it had just been a dream. I saw the motel's owner come to the shrine, with some scents and fruits in his arms. I had not talked to him, but something told me that I had to, and that this would be my only chance to discuss with him. I calmly approached the man from behind. I did not know if he would be friendly, or speak English even. Before I opened my mouth, however, he turned around and looked at me, with a grin on his face. Giving him a proper greeting, I walked up in front of the shrine, where I had seen the girl the day before. I started the conversation by saying how hot it was, and told him about building the church. His English was not great, but it was conversational when taking it slow. We even managed a few jokes and laughs, and enjoyed each other's company. He asked me how I was feeling, and I said a bit dizzy, but it was manageable. He smiled and said, My daughter, sorry. The look on my face must have been amazing. He asked me if I was alright again, this time I could not even answer. The man let out a long sigh and showed me a picture from his old torn wallet. It was a photo of his daughter, smiling. I instantly doubted what I was seeing. It was that girl. It was the girl that was floating in front of this very shrine and swinging back and forth slightly. For a second I thought I had been mistaken and that she was alive. Before I could do anything else with that thought, he said, My daughter died. My hopes were crushed by his short words. Next, he made a circle with his hands, motioned his head through it, and made a choking face, explaining how she died. I will never forget the face he made. I started stuttering, trying to ask one of the many questions now racing through my mind. If she is really dead, I told him that I had seen his daughter in front of the shrine, and that she had been... I couldn't bring myself to say it. The owner's face was featureless. He just stared into my eyes, before breaking out into a smile. His smile was so big that it stunned me. I know, he said. After that, I did not have the courage to say anything else to him, or stay with him for that matter. I made my way back to the church to be with my group and share my story. The leaders looked stunned, and separated me from the group to speak with me alone. They told me more about the motel. They had been in contact with the motel owner for many years. The missionary course has to find safe motels to stay and eat at, and he was a dedicated Christian who had welcomed missionaries to his motel many times. One day, his daughter committed suicide, 
hanging herself. After this, the owner lost himself, going somewhat crazy. He established the shrine for his daughter, saying that she would visit him and the shrine. He loved her so very much. He lost himself in his grief. After all this, I did not go back to that motel for any reason. I ended up sleeping in the half-built church, using a Bible as a pillow. I do not know why, but having a Bible around my head somewhat helped ease the pain of the headache I still had. I did have some nightmares. I was so traumatized by what had happened, and kept seeing the hanged girl in my dreams until I left that place. When everything was over, and we landed in Hawaii, my sister greeted me with open arms. I was eager to discuss with her what had happened before. Going back to the same dark prayer room as before, she straight away asked me, Did you see her as well? There is an old Quaker cemetery a couple of miles from my house. To get there, you have to drive to a path behind a local airport and then walk three quarters of a mile through thick woods. The walk normally takes around 10 to 15 minutes. This particular cemetery is infamous among the local community, with many stories and urban legends associated with it. Some say that a boy hung himself there in the 1800s. Others report a roaring sound coming from the woods surrounding it. To some, the cemetery is known as the seventh gate to hell. The legend goes that, spread throughout the US, there are eight cemeteries known as the Eight Gates of Hell. Admittedly, America has no shortage of haunted graveyards, but these eight are said to be the worst. Supposedly, the location of the eighth cemetery is only revealed after visiting the first seven. There have been maybe a dozen accounts of such searches going on, but only two claim to have ventured to the final secret location. It is said that no one heard back from these people again after visiting the 8th cemetery. None of this really deterred me from checking out Spidergate Cemetery. My friends and I quite often visited it at night because we liked the thrill of thinking there might be something actually paranormal in this area. I've always been a firm believer of the paranormal, but I've never been scared of anything I've heard. One night in mid-October, my friends and I decided to go to the cemetery again. It was still quite warm, and I picked up my friends from their houses and drove them to where we had to start walking. I've been to the cemetery during the day and at night more times than I can count, so I knew precisely how long it took to walk the path, and what the surroundings looked like, even at night. When we reached where the tree line began, everything seemed normal. However, when we got to the creek which marked the halfway point to the cemetery, I started to feel uneasy. I had never had this feeling before during the previous times I'd gone to this place. Unnerved, I looked around. My friends asked me what was wrong. I brushed it off and told them it was nothing, joking that I was just trying to freak them out. However, the uneasy feeling just kept getting worse the closer we got to the cemetery. A little way past the creek, lightheadedness washed over me, and I started getting tunnel vision. Once again, this sort of thing had never happened to me before, and I had felt fine at the start of the walk. It was then that I noticed the surrounding area looked different from usual. Not only that, but the walk to the cemetery seemed to be taking longer than normal. Around 100 yards from the cemetery gates, my tunnel vision and lightheaded feeling went away. My friends and I went into the cemetery and walked around for a bit. The uneasy feeling still troubled me, but nothing out of the ordinary happened. After a while, we started our walk back to where we had parked. All throughout that walk back, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched and followed. There was a tightness in my chest and a constant chill down my spine. I told my friends what I was feeling, and they said that they felt like something was watching us too. In silence, we hurried through the woods. This time, the walk took the usual amount of time, and the surroundings looked familiar. When we finally reached the end of the woods, the heavy feeling in my chest lifted. The sensation of being watched, however, remained. It was like I could feel eyes on me 
Terrified, I didn't dare look back until I was halfway to the car. At that point, curiosity got the better of me. I turned back to the entrance to the woods. There, at the tree line, was a dark figure, just staring at us. Unmoving, unflinching. I knew we had to get out of there. We jumped into the car and sped away. I wasn't satisfied until we were back on some main streets that I knew, away from the wood in the cemetery. Away from that figure. It had followed us, and then just stood there, watching as we went back to my car. I haven't been back to the cemetery since, but plan to go back now that the weather is warmer, to see if it happens again. This was the first time I have been genuinely scared by this kind of experience. I will never think of Spidergate Cemetery the same way again. About a year ago, my sister and her boyfriend moved into a new house in the south of Wales. After the terrible things that happened in that place, I looked into the history of the building. There was no known ominous past. It was clean, ordinary, which makes the events that I am about to describe all the more horrifying. For a while after they moved in, all was quiet. Admittedly, the property did feel strange in itself, but we all dismissed that. That was until the occurrences began to happen. It initially began when my sister claimed her deceased boyfriend was near. Her previous boyfriend had died in early 2013. The loss had affected both of our families heavily, especially my sister. When she said that she felt his presence, she told us that his spirit was there to protect her. To protect her from the darkness that lurked in that house. It was after that that things got bad. My sister told me that one day, upon entering the house, that it was like someone or something was in the doorway preventing her from getting past. Almost like she was not wanted in that place. She and her boyfriend began seeing scratch marks and blood stains on the walls, only for them to disappear mysteriously by themselves after a few days. On one occasion, my sister even found a wrench covered in blood, but that too turned up clean a few days later. They could not explain what was happening. By this point, both her and her boyfriend were very afraid. One evening I was ushered down with my mother and stepfather, because the police had been called to the house. When we got there, we were told that my sister's friend had seen a body in the attic. It had been rolled up inside of a mattress. Yet, when the police arrived, there was no body and no mattress. My sister was in hysterics, wildly throwing around accusations of murder screeching that it could have been her own dead body wrapped up in that mattress. She was terrified for her life. After her outburst, the police questioned my sister's mental state. She underwent a mental examination the following week, which found her to be perfectly healthy. Besides, she had not been the only one to see and experience these things in that house. It was like whatever dwelled there was tormenting her. They moved out not long afterwards. We found out from a friend of hers that since then, no one has stayed in that house for more than a few months. In the months that followed, I began to wonder whether or not my sister truly felt her late boyfriend's spirit there, or whether that dark entity had pretended to be him, so that she would open herself up and in doing so become more vulnerable. Recently, a planchette from a Ouija board was left on the doorstep of her new house. My sister never used a board, and didn't even know what the planchette was until my grandmother told her. She discarded of the thing immediately. Where it came from, or how it got there, is unknown. This has been a lifelong progression. 
I cannot say definitively whether I am haunted by one or more entities. All I know is that I have been stalked by something all my life. My mother once told me something that happened when I was a baby. It was night time, and she woke up feeling uneasy, worried that something was wrong with me. She got up and went to check on me. When she walked into my room, she stood frozen in shock. She told me that there had been a woman dressed in white standing over my crib. The woman slowly turned to face my mother. She looked progressively sad, but my mother's adrenaline kicked in and she sprinted over to my crib, at which point she saw that my blanket was completely covering my mouth, smothering me. After that night, my mother would not allow me to sleep alone until I was much older. It is important to note that both my parents believe this woman in white was my deceased great-grandmother, who was sending signals to my mum to save me. I, on the other hand, do not believe so. Ever since I was a young boy, I've always believed something is watching me, as if some entity was evilly contemplating how best to obtain me. I have just always felt a presence around me. After high school I got a job and didn't really feel that presence creeping around me like it always had done before. However, one day when I was in the shower, the feeling of being watched returned. This was impossible. My work schedule left me alone in the house to get ready and leave. So troubled was I that I decided to look out of the shower. There was no one there. I finished the shower and then proceeded to brush my teeth, still unable to shake the feeling of being watched. I hurried up and finished then ran into my room, got ready, and left for work. From then on, the ominous feeling of being watched was stronger than it had been ever before. The next day, I was getting ready again, and felt that same cold, evil stare. I checked. Still nothing. I finished in the shower and started brushing my teeth as quickly as I could, hurrying to get away to work. Because I was always the last one to leave the house, I showered with the bathroom door open. I noticed that the cat had come into the room and was staring at me. I felt relieved. It had just been the cat. I told it to quit staring at me so intensely, but it didn't. The cat was transfixed. I asked again, telling the cat it's really freaking me out and needs to go, all the while making my voice steadily rise to a yell, hoping to scare it away. The cat doesn't move. It doesn't even blink. I grab a comb and throw it at the cat, hoping to startle it. It hits the cat right in the head, yet no moving, no blinking, nothing. It was then that I realised the cat wasn't staring at me, it was staring at the mirror behind me. I turned around to face the mirror, and saw a woman in white gently glide into the room. She appeared to be wearing a nightgown. The most terrifying part was that she had no facial features. No eyes, no lips, no nose, no ears just a blank space of white. My breath caught in my chest, and I sprinted into my room, snatched my clothes, and ran out of the house, getting dressed in the car. The next week I couldn't sleep and barely ate. I kept having nightmares, and felt eyes watching me. Yet again I was in the shower washing my hair for work. I felt that presence again. I looked. Nothing there. I decided to turn away and face my shower wall, hoping it would make everything go away. It was then that I felt it move into the room with me. Suddenly I felt a hand grab my forearm and pull me. It grabbed me so hard that I fell out the shower onto the floor, almost pulling the shower curtain down with me. I rushed out of the house, once again getting dressed in my car. When I got to work, I ran to the bathroom to wash the rest of the shampoo from my hair. While working, one of my co-workers looked at me, concerned. He asked what happened to my arm, and I felt taken aback considering I hadn't told anyone what had happened to me this morning. It was then that I realised there was a dark bruise on my arm. It was in the shape of a VI, very similar to the Roman numeral for six. After this incident, the nightmares became more intense. Every time I fell asleep, the faceless woman in white came to me in my dreams. This continued for some time, until, randomly, they stopped for around a week. I felt so relieved. One morning I woke up, nightmare free, 
the sun shining brightly into my room. My first thought was that this day was going to be perfect. I could have sprung out of bed. Only I didn't. I couldn't move. My entire body was paralysed except for my eyes. It was almost as though the sun had been blotted from the sky, the mood in my room changed so suddenly. Complete dread, and the feeling that something holy and decisively evil was there with me. I looked at my doorway, and there it stood. It was a tall, black figure, with long arms and fingers that came down to sharp points. The arms and fingers were touching the floor. The entity looked spiky all over. Just imagine the scary drawings from pretty much any child in a scary movie, and that was what this creature was. It was there, with me, in my room. It had dark, blue eyes, and with them it stared straight at me. I will never ever forget that moment, those eyes, or that jagged, horrid, demon-esque shadow. I was trying as hard as possible to move, keeping in mind that I am an athletic build and rather strong, but I was pinned to the bed. I couldn't move an inch, or amass any strength to even yell out. I knew that it had intentions to hurt me. It took one long step into my room, when my cat ran over and stared at it. Growling at it, the cat jumped at the shadow, which instantly made the shadow dissipate. That was the final straw. I refused to live in that house any longer. I moved in with my grandmother. No one in my family believed what I told them. However, my dad did say that he yelled at the spirit to make it leave, in the hope that I would decide to move back in. Somewhat foolishly, I hoped he was right. However, as soon as I stepped inside that house, I was crippled with the same familiar fear. The presence was there, and it was angry that I had gone. That night, when I tried to sleep, I kept hearing a woman's voice in my ear, whispering my family's names along with the horrendous acts that would befall them. After that, my sister was targeted by the entity too. She would hear noises and feel like she was being watched. As for me, the black shadow figure seemed to loom over my entire room, and was just outside the corner of my eye at every angle. I once again tried moving out. This time I went to live with some friends, but the feeling followed me, as did the nighttime whispers and noises. The first night I moved in, I was startled, violently awake by the sound of a woman gasping, like she was drowning. I snapped awake, but there was no one there, and no one else in the house heard anything. Eventually I returned to my parents' house because of money problems. Wherever I go, I am followed. I am tormented. I am too scared to go to the clergy, out of fear that this may provoke this demon, or whatever it is, to do worse to me or my family. I fear for my sister. I fear for myself. I have been stalked my whole life by at least one evil entity, and it doesn't seem to plan on leaving me alone any time soon. I find that it's hard to talk to people about the paranormal, especially in the African American community. My first memory of the paranormal was waking up and seeing a ghostly woman beyond my bedroom door. I wasn't scared, but was curious as to what she was looking at. She was staring at the wall, with a look of sadness. My brother and I shared a room, and I tried to wake him, but he wouldn't budge. When I turned my lamp on, she disappeared. That was one of the only times I have ever had a peaceful encounter with the paranormal. After that, it felt like I was being targeted. Why I was, I still do not know. At first, the activity in our house didn't seem malevolent. If anything, I got the feeling that, whatever it was, was trying to get my attention. Every night, my arm would be pulled, dragging me from my sleep. My grandma told me it was my grandpa, who I'd never met, playing around. She said that if I was scared, I should tell him to stop. So, the next time it happened, I sat up in my bed and asked it to stop. Never was my arm grabbed again, and for a while, I got some rest. Before too long, the sleep paralysis began. 
I was helpless and felt a darkness in my room each time it happened. I still shared a bedroom with my brother, he on the bottom bunk, me on the top, but I was never able to wake him during these experiences. Although I had never met my grandpa, I wondered if he was truly capable of scaring me so. I wondered if the presence I felt most nights nice was even him at all. At certain times of the year, sleeping on the top bunk so near to the ceiling became unbearable because of the heat. On those nights, I would go to the living room and sleep on the couch. Even there, I would be woken up, this time to the sounds of glass breaking in the kitchen and pans banging. When I turned on the kitchen lights, everything was fine. It felt like something was trying really hard to get my attention. Still, I told myself I was going crazy, because nobody else heard the noises. My brother laughed at me and told me I was insane, but did agree to sleep with me in the living room one night anyway. The first night went off without a hitch, but the very next night, whilst I was deep in a much needed sleep, my brother woke me up in a panic. Did you hear that? He asked. There was banging and clashing in the kitchen. As usual, when I flicked the light switch on, the kitchen was spotless. I was glad that I finally had a witness, although my brother and I never spoke of this again. We became busy teenagers and hardly stayed at home. My brothers all graduated and moved on. Because of that, they didn't get to witness the change our father was going through. But I did. He became alcoholic and verbally abusive towards me and my mother. He put dark trash bags over the windows to block out the sun and yelled at us for having the lights on. The only light he tolerated was the glow of the TV. Often, he would sit in complete darkness, smoking and drinking beer. Everything about him changed. Even the smell of him changed. He started to smell of sulfur. I remember hating having my friends over after school because they thought my parents never paid the electricity bill. They could not realise that was how my father liked to live. Many times I would walk to my grandmother's house, which was only 50 yards from my own. There I could watch my favourite shows and sometimes eat dinner in a lit environment. The change in my father occurred after he took a trip down south to see someone he called a witch doctor. He would often talk about it, retelling the story with the same details. Supposedly, he and a few co-workers went down there because they had heard that the witch doctor had got another co-worker out of possible jail time, for a crime he actually committed. To my knowledge, my dad never broke the law, so I am not sure why he went. He never told us that. The only point he was always clear to stress was that voodoo and witchcraft is very real, and that my brothers and I should stay away from it. He said that on the way to the witch doctor they saw an anaconda in the middle of the road, and ran it over with his work truck. After they hit it, he and his co-workers heard a loud scream, but they kept on driving. When they arrived at the witch doctor's place, the man they encountered already knew who they were and why they had come. He told them that they would have to pay double for having ran over his pet snake. My dad said he apologised and paid. He never said anything about what happened whilst they were there. However, he always ended his story the same way. On the drive back, there was a guy limping towards them in the middle of the road, forcing them to stop their truck. The guy was cursing at them, and my dad asked why he was so mad. The guy said, I'm mad because you ran me over earlier. My dad told him there must have been a mistake as they hit a snake earlier. He told me that after that the guy went quiet and stared at them with malice. A co-worker told my dad to drive away, and so they sped off. It sounds ridiculous, I know. As a kid, I laughed whenever my dad told us, and I still grin about it now, just thinking about it. But dad never smiled when he told us. Not once. Within a year of his visit to the witch doctor, all of his co-worker friends who had gone with him were dead. All died in horrible ways. It was during this time that I was woken at night by my bed rattling. When I opened my eyes, I saw a massive werewolf-like figure at the foot of my bed. 
it had a massive torso and its facial features kind of resembled my dad. I sat up both terrified and angry and the entity fled in the direction of my parents room. Surely this had been a dream. Whatever the explanation, it had been the last straw for me. After that, I slept with my friends and family members every chance I could. If I couldn't, I stayed up all night at our house. Nearly ten years passed. After college, like most graduates, I struggled to make a living and had a massive school loan. Recently, my grandma had passed away and her house was unoccupied. It was the house my mother had grown up in. When she married my father, my grandma had a small house built on the property for my parents to settle down in. By the time I moved back, my mother had remarried. She still lived in my childhood home with her new husband. Living in my grandma's house by myself was a pleasant experience. My grandma had been a great human being, and I could feel the goodness of her energy in that building. When I moved in, there were times when I would wake up to the sound of her voice, calling my name. There'd be a smell of flowers in various parts of the house that would come and go. My niece, the great-granddaughter my grandma never met, would come to visit and make comments about Grand Gran. She would say that Grand Gran talked to her and would tell us things about how my grandma loved the remodeling. My niece would walk around and point out things I had changed in the house, even though she hadn't even yet been conceived when I had made those changes. But things did not stay like that forever. My oldest brother got out of the military and needed a place to live. He stayed with me for a bit, but we never had a great relationship, so my mom decided to let him move into our childhood home while she and my stepdad moved in with me. I didn't like the idea, but I had no choice because the property was willed in her name. The day they moved in, the shift in atmosphere was like night and day. You know how every house has a smell and a feel? When they moved in, the house smelled different, and tension filled the air. I had lived like a bachelor, meaning I didn't have pictures hanging, nor was I decorating every room. When my mom moved in, she put pictures and religious figurines in every room, even the bathroom. Yet, not once did that place feel homely to me again. The atmosphere was oppressive, similar to before I had moved away and still lived with my dad, but in some respects, it was worse. I began having terrible nightmares in which I repeatedly witnessed the death of my family members. Then, dreams became reality. I dreamed of a poisonous snake in my kitchen sink, biting me as I was pouring a glass of water after waking up, as I usually do. When I woke up from that nightmare, I went to the kitchen to get a glass, and was going to pour some water into it when something told me to turn on the lights. I did, and found a snake coiled up in my sink. Next, I would hear scratching on the walls. The scent of flowers was replaced by the stench of mould and urine. I saw shadows everywhere and constantly had the feeling of being watched. The house was infested with darkness. Was this darkness attached to me? When I left for college, I had no paranormal experiences. This made me wonder if it was attached to my mother. Had my father brought something into our house after visiting the witch doctor, which had now followed my mother? Whatever this darkness was, it seemed to feed on male energy. My stepdad became depressed, and started acting similar to how my father had been when I was a child. He grew to love the dark. After about a year, he stopped sleeping in the same bed as my mother because she always kept the lamp on. Mostly, he slept in the dining room. The only light he tolerated was the TV, just like my father. As for my childhood home, where my older brother now lived, the atmosphere there was as polluted as ever. He liked the dark and drank a lot. He had poor hygiene and was belligerent. My mother explained his behaviour as PTSD, yet I thought otherwise. It was the darkness, which now had a hold over both houses. Living as we did, as I had done as a teenager, was burdensome. I could feel the darkness all the time. After about a year after my mum and stepdad moved in, I went to California on vacation to get away from everything and everyone. I was in the hotel lobby using my laptop 
when an older lady tapped my shoulder and asked to chat with me. I didn't know who she was, but said yes. Immediately she told me she was psychic, and began telling me things about my life that no stranger would know. She also told me that I had a dark aura surrounding me. She told me that someone I knew had put the darkness on me. She then took my hand and asked me to pray with her, and I admit that I did feel like a weight was lifted from my shoulders afterwards. But, at the same time, when I returned home it was like nothing had changed. One night I came home from work and went to unlock the front door to get inside. I could see the living room lamp on the inside through the glass and the thin curtain on the other side of the door. As I unlocked the door and turned the knob, something turned it back in the opposite direction. I looked up again and saw the silhouette of my stepdad on the other side of the door, holding the knob. At first I thought he was playing around and laughed, but it went on longer than it should. I began to get irritated and went to the side door of the house. In doing so, I passed by the window which looked into my parents' room. Both my mom and stepdad were inside. He was asleep and she was on the phone. I went inside and asked her how long he had been asleep and she told me for a few hours. Soon after this event, my bedroom became a hot spot for strange occurrences. I'd wake up to freezing temperatures during warm weather. Sleep paralysis returned, and I would see figures moving around my bed, shape-shifting. One night, I was sleeping on my side, when something tapped my head three times and growled in my ear. I could feel its cold breath and guttural voice in my ear. The three spots I was tapped on later turned into large boils that had to be removed surgically. As time went by, my health declined, and my nose bled all the time. My mother freaked out during one of my nosebleeds because I was on my fourth towel. The other three were soaked in my blood. She cried out that humans don't have that much blood in them. However, when I went to the doctor, I passed every test given to me. That same day, when I came back home, my stepdad was working on his car in the front yard. As I approached the house, he looked at me with confusion. I asked him what was wrong, and he said that he thought I'd let someone borrow my car because he thought I'd been at home. He told me that he had seen me watching him from inside the house. He was 100% sure it had been me because of its build and that it was wearing a hoodie. That night, while I dozed in and out of sleep, I was awoken once more. This time, it was due to the feeling of electricity going through my body. I was paralysed, but felt the current surge through my chest. When my eyes focused on my surroundings, I saw a large figure with a snake-like body and small arms, hovering above me. It had a skeletal face and no eyes. I am not a very religious person, even though I grew up Southern Baptist and I do believe in God. I don't know who answered my prayers that night, but in my mind I called out to God, Jesus, my grandmother, my guardian angels and spirit guide for help. Anyone who would listen. In my room, there is a window that faces me towards the foot of the bed. From outside, a light the size of a basketball appeared. It shined bright, then muted to a slow blink. Around the seventh blink, the dark entity vanished, as did the light. After that, I wasn't attacked again. The final encounter in that house happened whilst I was watching my mom and stepdad argue in the kitchen. It was the nastiest argument I've heard in my life. They were saying stuff to each other that was malicious, with the intent to cause harm. Sometime during that fight, I knew their marriage ended. I didn't need to step in because my mother was clearly the victor in this verbal battle. Even so, I kept close, as I felt this was one of those arguments that could lead to physical assault. What happened, however, not even I could have anticipated. A kitchen cabinet flew off the wall towards my stepdad, missing him by a few inches. The poor man screamed in fear and ran from the room. I was in shock, but my mom just laughed, saying it was grandma protecting her house. Everyone who knew grandma knew she wouldn't hurt a fly, let alone tear a kitchen cupboard from the wall and throw it at someone. Afterwards, I inspected the wall and saw how the cabinets were firmly mounted. 
Isaac Newton told us the rule of gravity says what goes up must come down. That heavy cabinet should have just fallen off the wall, but it had flown about three feet, as if someone from behind the wall had pushed it. That was it for me. I was done with the property for good at that moment. I found an apartment and moved in two days later. Today, my mum and I still speak about the strange things that occurred whilst we lived there, like the horrible deaths of all our pets, and how ravens would cover this one specific tree on the property and squawk at the house. I cannot explain the events that happened there, but I believe they are connected to my father's visit to the witch doctor. I once tried to put together a paranormal team and do an investigation at the property, but the new owner leveled everything down to the ground and turned it into a horse pasture. I never had the chance to go back there, but my mom recently told me that the owner had to move the horses to another place due to them being uneasy and sick all the time. Nowadays, I am much happier and healthier. I no longer have nightmares and my random nosebleeds have stopped. I refuse to go back to the property, even though my mom wants me to see how it's been converted into a beautiful horse farm. Perhaps someday I'll drive by and take a look but I will never step foot on that property again. I am 28 years old, married, with a baby girl on the way. I'm very happy. However, there is an experience from my childhood that haunts me to this day. I was in the 8th grade, and my mother, sisters and I had fallen on hard times. We bounced between a shelter and a friend's house. After my mom started dating the man who would later become my stepfather, we all moved into a house together. I was ecstatic. I would finally have my own space. But as soon as I walked into that place, my happiness dissipated. It was like a jolt of electricity went through me. Everywhere in that house, I felt uneasy. Bizarrely, the most comfortable place to be in that building was the basement. The first thing you should know about this house is that the upstairs was totally sealed off. All of the doors to the upstairs were painted over and nailed shut. The only explanation we were ever given was that it was being rebuilt. A vague remark which was never elaborated upon. All I really know is that my sisters and I weren't allowed up there, and that the doors were firmly nailed shut. One time, my sisters and I tried to be brave and investigate, but the doors were so terrifying that we completely chickened out. The daytime in that house was uncomfortable, yet the nighttime was far worse. What was an uneasy feeling quickly turned into a paralyzing terror absolute dread. The house always seemed so much darker than it should. The first incident I experienced there was of sleep paralysis. I would wake up, unable to scream or move anything but my eyes. And that wasn't very useful, as I've always had a bad stigmatism, needing glasses to see anything. Several times I woke up about 2am paralyzed and afraid to blink. Often, I would hear my closet door quietly shut before being able to move again. The second time something happened, I was alone inside the house whilst my mother and sisters waited in the car. I was searching for something when I heard someone call my name. Thinking it was my mother yelling for me to hurry, I turned and went into her room, which was right next to the driveway, to tell her I was trying to hurry. What happened next still terrifies me. The door to the upstairs in my mother's room was open. Remember, these doors were not only painted over, but nailed shut. I heard my voice again, only this time, it was a whisper and it came from the stairs beyond the open door. I was so scared that I noped out my mum's bedroom window. For that, I was immediately grounded, for lying and being dramatic. Later, when we got home, 
The door was now closed, but the paint was clearly broken and the nails lay all over the floor. This too resulted in me being grounded. I have no idea what spurned my mother to have us move, but shortly after this we moved to the next town over. I have never been so glad to move in my life. I am a firm believer of the paranormal. Ghosts, aliens, the works. However, up until just a few years ago, I had not had any encounters with any paranormal entities. Since then, however, I have had multiple experiences which I believe are connected to and caused by the same entity. In 2014, I moved into a new apartment with my new roommate and my then boyfriend. Not long after we moved in, I was rummaging through a storage closet on the apartment's balcony. It was night and I had the closet door open as well as the light on. While I was repacking a box, I noticed a dark shape move out the corner of my eye. When I looked towards the closet, I saw a dark, humanoid figure dart inside of it. Initially, I thought that someone had climbed onto the porch somehow, but found no one in the closet when I looked. Confused and a little shaken, I shut the closet door and never opened it again until I moved. A few weeks after that, I experienced sleep paralysis for the first time. I was lying in bed, talking to my boyfriend beside me. It felt almost like a time jump. One second we were talking, and the next it was dead silent. I opened my eyes and saw a face right in front of mine. Although it appeared to be a human face, it looked like it was painted to resemble that of a tiger. It got harder to breathe, and I couldn't move, regardless of how hard I tried. I closed my eyes for what felt like minutes, and opened them again, this time with no face looming above me. All at once, it felt like sound and fresh air returned to the room, normality restored. I fell asleep quickly, despite the ordeal. Both this and the closet shadow I blamed on my imagination. I must have been seeing things. The following year, I had moved into a new apartment with my boyfriend, as well as a very close friend of mine. One night, she asked me if I noticed anything strange in the house. I replied with no, not having seen anything out of the ordinary the night before. She then proceeded to tell me that she had woken up in the middle of the night and had seen a tall, dark figure standing in her open closet. My mind instantly went back to the night I saw the shadow person in my old apartment's closet. Fear instantly washed over me. However, instead of making a big deal out of it, we decided to play it off as a joke. We even named the entity Toby from the Paranormal Activity series. From then on, whenever something strange would happen in the house, we would say that Toby did it. It was always light-hearted, as nothing severe ever happened to warrant a more serious response. That said, I could not escape the sense of unease I felt, especially when alone in the apartment. I am not sure if my friend ever saw the shadow figure again. If she did, she never told me. When the time came to move again, I was stupid. This time, it was just going to be me and my now fiancé. So, as the last of the boxes were taken out, I asked my friend who was going to get custody of Toby. This was a question I never should have asked. After some joking, I said that I would take him and told Toby to come see your new house as I left the old apartment. It was only a few weeks into living in the new place when the activity started. In the beginning, we would hear knocks on the wall. Loud knocks. I complained to management but they told me that no one lived on either side of me or above, as the apartment complex was brand new. From there, it escalated. We would find that the thermostat had been turned way down, well below 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Even weirder, we would, and still do, find puddles of water on the floor, with no way for the water to have got there on its own. There would be large puddles in the middle of the wood, nowhere near a sink or tub, and not created by a leak in the floor or ceiling. 
Already in the habit of blaming Toby, my fiancé and I continue to reference the unknown entity as the source of all inexplicable events in the apartment. Nothing violent ever happened, but we were scared of what this dark entity might do next. I believe that whatever had followed us did not have good intentions. We decided to stop paying attention to it. After that, the activity ceased almost entirely. Regardless, I still get scared when home alone. Although we haven't seen any dark figures in corners lately, I'm always worried that one will run by me when I'm the only one home. Every now and then we will find the thermostat turned to a very cold setting, or find a stray puddle of water on the floor. Almost like it is reminding us that it's still here. This story takes place over the span of about five years, beginning back in 1999 during my second year of middle school and ending near my 18th birthday. Before I begin, I'd like to apologize for the length of this story, as it really means a lot to me and I feel that I need to spend some time explaining all of the details. Now, I've never been one to believe in ghosts and spirits and all that. Even now, I find it very hard to place my trust in the supposed paranormal encounters that I hear from time to time. However, these events that I'm about to share changed my life forever, and I will never think about life and death the same way again. The story starts when I was 12 years old and attending 7th grade in Black Forest, Colorado. I didn't have many friends at the time because I was new to the area and I was also a bit shy. I honestly can't recall who I was friends with back then. However, I remember very clearly the day that I met her. She was a tall blonde girl who always had this sad and confused look in her eyes. Her name was Ali. I had seen her around the school before and I knew that there was something a little off about her, like she had some kind of mental disability or something. Whenever I saw her, she was always sitting somewhere by herself while drawing in her notebook. People used to make fun of her every now and then because she was so quiet, like she literally never spoke a word to anyone, ever. I actually thought that she might have been mute. It wasn't until about halfway through the second semester when I finally met her. I noticed her standing near the school entrance, clutching her notebooks tightly to her chest and looking as though she was about to cry. A few kids were holding up a picture that she had drawn, waving it around in the air while taunting her, with nothing better to do than humiliate this poor girl. I decided to intervene because I was so disgusted with how cruel those kids were being to her. I quickly walked up from behind and snatched the drawing with one hand while grabbing Ali's hand and pulling her away with the other. I gave little concern to the bullies, cursing me from behind, and we kept walking hand in hand for a few seconds before I pulled her aside and handed her the drawing. You really need to stand up for yourself, I said. Next time you should just walk away from them, like seriously, don't even pay attention to those jerks, okay? She didn't seem to acknowledge any of my words. Her eyes were fixed on her crumpled up drawing. I can walk you home if you like. Ali pursed her lips for a moment before she finally shifted her gaze towards me. We looked at each other for a few seconds, and then she smiled softly and nodded her head. I tried to make small talk with her on the way over to her house, but she only ever made subtle facial expressions and nodded her head in response. It was a bit awkward to be honest, but I felt really bad for her and I just wanted someone to treat her like a human being for once. I don't think she realised how pretty she was and I kept wondering about what could have led her to have such a poor self-image. After about 20 minutes or so, we both arrived in front of her house. Immediately, I got a very creepy vibe from the place. I could tell that Ali didn't like the house either as she seemed slightly hesitant to open the rusted black gate that separated the overgrown yard from the sidewalk. She carefully walked up to the front door and stalled for a bit before walking inside. Then she turned around and waved at me as she closed the door behind her. 
I really didn't want to hang around near that house any longer, so I continued to jog down the road to my house a little faster than usual. The next day, I sat alone on the bleachers after school and watched the soccer team practice for a while. Half an hour or so had passed since I sat down, when I thought I heard footsteps coming from behind me, so I turned around to see who else had nothing better to do than watch the junior high soccer team practice. To my surprise, it was Ali. She smiled at me when she saw that I noticed her, and she continued to walk down the aisle towards where I was sitting. She sat down next to me, and then looked out at the field. I've always enjoyed watching sports, although I never seem to understand them, she said softly. Obviously, I was a bit bewildered when she said this. Here, I had thought that she wasn't able to speak. I must have been the first person at the school that she had ever spoken to. I was about to make some kind of remark about her finally talking, but I thought I'd better not as I didn't want to offend her. Yeah, me too. Soccer is the only sport where I really feel like I know what's going on, I replied. It took me a few too many seconds before I thought of something else to say. You seem to really like drawing, I remarked. She blushed a little when I said that. My mom taught me how to draw. Was your mom an artist? I asked. I think so, she replied. I didn't know her very well. She passed away a long time ago. I'm sorry. My mum also died a while back. She seemed to open up a lot more after I said that. Eventually, she told me about how she had been living alone with her father for most of her life. She kept telling me that he was a mean man, and he would often punish her for the smallest of mistakes. She mentioned that her dad once forcefully held her hand in boiling water because she knocked over a bowl of soup by accident. He also blamed her for every time he had a bad day at work. After hearing this, I started to feel sick. I couldn't believe what she was telling me. She was such a sweet person. She sure as hell didn't deserve to be treated like trash by everyone, including her own father. After about 15 minutes into our conversation, the sun broke free from behind the clouds, and Ali started to take off her jacket. When she did this, I caught a glimpse of several pink ribbon scars along her forearm. I felt my heart sink after seeing this. I was uncertain as to what I should say, but I eventually just asked if she wanted to hang out after school sometime. She seemed unsure at first, but let out a slight smile and agreed. Sometime later that week, Ali came over to my house and insisted that we watch 10 Things I Hate About You together. We both had a pretty good time and she seemed really happy. I remember us playing foosball for a while, and at one point I somehow managed to hit the ball upwards and into the ceiling fan, which sent it sailing across the room like a rocket before crash landing inside my fishbowl. That was the first time I had ever heard her laugh, and I'll never forget that sound. After that, Ali and I became close friends. We would walk to school together, eat lunch together, and after school we would often go exploring in the woods behind my house. Despite her seeming really happy and full of life while she was with me, I could always tell that she was hiding something. I could sense that she was slowly falling apart underneath the mask that she wore when I was around. She never wanted to go back home after school, and sometimes she would come over to my house late at night because she was afraid of her dad. I remember us talking about how we were going to run away and never come back. She was like a sister to me and I felt like I had to do everything that I could to protect her. I really wanted her to live the peaceful life that I knew she truly deserved, and I felt that if I didn't look after her, no one else would. As time went on though, we started to see each other less and less. Ali ended up going to a different high school than me, and I moved 20 minutes or so outside of town, so she couldn't walk to my house anymore. I started to get caught up in some unfortunate things that were going on in my life. I sort of drifted off from reality for a while. My dad and stepmom got a divorce shortly after I turned 16, and as a result, I became a bit of an alcoholic. I soon fell into a rather serious depression, and I stopped talking to many of my friends. I only saw Ali once maybe every few months at this point. Eventually, my junior year of high school came around, 
and this was about the time that I started to have these really weird dreams, which I now believe have some sort of spiritual meaning. Keep in mind that I'm really not much of a religious person. This all happened over 12 years ago, but I can clearly recall almost every detail in my mind. The first dream happened one night after I had practically drank myself to sleep. I found myself standing upside down in a nearly pitch black forest somewhere. It was like the whole world had been flipped and gravity was somehow reversed. I looked all around and saw nothing but a dense overgrowth of intertwining branches and leaves. The place was oddly familiar and I felt like I had been there before, although I could not quite put my finger on it. I noticed an old rope swing tied to a tree that was swaying back and forth in the breeze. It was hanging upside down and pointed towards the vacant night sky. When I saw this, it felt as though something had just punched me in the gut, like I had just been electrocuted. I then heard a loud ringing sound in my ears and began to discern a very tall figure about ten yards ahead of me in the woods. Whatever this thing was, it must have stood roughly forty or so feet high, as it was towering above the trees. The entity was incredibly thin, probably only a foot or two wide. It blended in perfectly with the dense foliage, and if it were not for its haunting white eyes which illuminated part of the forest canopy, it would have easily been mistaken for a tree. I was suddenly overwhelmed with an enormous feeling of sadness and heartbreak, the likes of which I have never felt before. I felt myself fall to my knees and my vision became very blurry with tears. This tall black creature then bent down so that its face was only a few feet from mine. The only feature I could make out on this thing were its eyes, which were blindingly bright at this point. I don't remember being afraid of this thing and I got the impression that it felt sympathy for me. Without opening its mouth, it began to speak in this soft, calm voice. It said, I am here, you are not. My chest began to sting as it spoke, and again it repeated the sentence, I am here, you are not. It said the same thing five or six more times before its eyes suddenly started to shimmer with red and blue light. The light grew brighter and brighter until all I could see were the colours red and blue. And then I woke up. Only a couple of seconds after I awoke, I was immediately startled by my alarm going off, which was set for 7.30am. I reached over and turned off my alarm, and then sat up in my bed, confused, trying to make sense of what had just happened. What was that supposed to mean? I thought to myself. I realised that the horrible feeling of grief that I had just felt moments ago was now nowhere to be found, yet I remembered it very clearly. It just felt like a normal dream, the feeling was gone, and I wasn't really all that shaken up by the whole thing. Still, something didn't feel quite normal about that dream. Puzzled, I got up out of bed and carried on with my day. About two weeks had passed after that, and the dream I had earlier was hardly ever on my mind anymore. I fell asleep one night on the couch while watching a movie, and once again found myself in the same dream world as before, although this time there was something different. The forest was burning bright with fire, and I could feel the heat coming from all around me. I looked around me to see if I could find that creature again and sure enough there it was, standing high above the treetops. I was immediately overwhelmed with that same painful sense of sadness that I had felt in my previous dream. This time I collapsed completely onto the wet ground beneath me. The dark figure then knelt down beside me and came very close to my face when it spoke in that same calm voice. However this time it sounded a little more urgent than before. It spoke to me softly quickly chanting the following phrase as if it did not have much time. Find me here, I'll be sleeping. It rapidly said the same thing several times before its eyes began to flash red and blue once again. I woke up in the same fashion as the first dream, 
and shortly afterwards I could hear my alarm go off in the other room. This seemed strange to me, because that meant that I had woken up at the exact same time as my last dream. The thought of this frightened me a little bit, but I still wasn't sure what the message I heard in my dream meant, if anything. I realised that this second dream was a lot shorter than the first one, like it had been sped up or something. As I did before, I continued on with my day, but this time I wasn't about to let the dreams go. I knew that there was something strange happening to me, and it wasn't just a dream like any other. I thought that there was surely going to be another dream like this sometime soon, so I patiently waited for my next experience. Two months went by, and by now I was willing to let go of the bizarre dreams and forget that they ever happened. I was exhausted after a long and particularly awful day at school, and I fell asleep as soon as I got home. That's when I had the third dream, and this one was not like the others. This felt very real. I was already lying on the ground and crying when this dream began, and the creature spent no time bending over towards me as it was already knelt down beside me. It was as if this creature didn't want to waste any time, and was abandoning the beginning of the dream. One other thing I noticed was that I was no longer hot from the surrounding fire. Instead, I was shivering from a biting cold, and the forest was covered in about a foot of snow. Without delaying, the eyes started to flash red and blue again as the creature spoke, only saying the phrase once this time. Why did you wait? You'll know when you feel it. I felt an electric shock race throughout my body before I was jolted awake. The moment I opened my eyes, I knew something was very wrong. I could sense that something bad was about to happen, and I didn't know how, but it felt like someone was watching my every move. Not in a creepy way, but more like whatever was watching me knew what was about to happen next, as if they had already seen it before. It didn't feel threatening to me. It felt sort of sad, like it felt deep empathy for me and wanted to comfort me, but didn't know how. It's hard to explain what I was feeling, it just all felt so clear in that moment. I was absolutely certain that something terrible was going to happen, but any attempt I might make to stop it from happening was hopeless. My shaking hand instinctively reached over to grab my phone for some sort of quick comfort. I noticed that it was 7.30pm. I then saw that I had 11 missed calls, so I checked my call history fearing the worst. I got a nauseating feeling in my stomach. It was Ali. She had called me 11 times whilst I was asleep. I didn't even bother to call her back. Instead, I threw off my covers and hurried downstairs and into the garage. I quickly hopped on my bike and headed out into the night. I remember praying desperately to God that everything would be okay as I rode towards Ali's house. The whole way there, I continued to feel as though someone was watching over me, pushing me to ride faster through the pouring rain and the dense fog. Finally, after an exhausting two hours of riding my bike, I entered my friend's neighbourhood. As I was rounding the corner nearest to her house, I began to see the reflections of red and blue lights shimmering off the wet ground. I felt all of the life drain from my body as I caught my first glimpse of the house. Men in yellow reflective suits rushed through the old iron gate, breaking down the door whilst calling out Ali's name. My gaze then shifted towards Ali's father, who was yelling out profanities while being held down over the hood of a police car. A wave of heat swept over me as I approached. The house was entirely engulfed in fire, and I stared helplessly at the flames as they rose high into the cool night air. I suddenly lost all my strength, and my legs gave way beneath me. The realisation that all this was really happening was slowly setting in. I felt the tears streaming down my face, and that's when I collapsed onto the ground. Eventually, one of the paramedics saw me laying there and came over to see what was wrong. I asked him if my friend was in there, but the man just shook his head and told me that he was sorry. I slowly handed the man my phone, 
and he called my stepmom for me. I think I sat there, broken hearted for at least an hour and a half, just watching the house as it burned to the ground, knowing that my friend was probably in there. My stepmother later came rushing up from behind, before hugging me tightly. I tried to hold back my tears in front of my stepmom, but to no avail. She knew how much Ali had meant to me at one time, and she kept telling me how much she loved me. She continued to embrace me for a while longer, before we finally headed back home. That night, I laid in bed staring at the ceiling until the sun came up. I managed to get some sleep around 8.30am, but when I awoke, I knew that whatever was watching over me was gone. The feeling I had the night before had completely left without a trace. I remember feeling very alone. It didn't take long for the news of what really happened to get around town. Ali had done something to upset her dad. Something minor and insignificant, I imagined. Yet he, in all his stupidity and drunken rage, decided to lock Ali in her room. Meanwhile, he went back downstairs and began tearing the place up. A common tradition with Ali's dad. He started throwing chairs against the walls, smashing bottles, and even knocked over a large fake tree in the living room, which ignited the moment it made contact with the fireplace. Long story short, her father claims that he was not able to rescue Ali and still have enough time to escape from the house himself. They think that Ali had taken a bunch of pills to force herself to fall asleep, afraid to later confront her dad, meaning that she was likely unconscious during the fire. I don't know what became of her father, all I know is that he was arrested and no one ever saw him again. The only thing that mattered to me was that I had just lost my only true friend, forever. I truly cannot describe how horrible the feeling was once I learned what happened to Ali. I wanted to mourn for my friend right then and there, but somehow I had forgotten altogether how to cry. My mind just became detached from it all, and besides, life wasn't about to grant me a moment of mourning just yet. No. My friend's death was soon followed by the death of my cousin, whom I was very close with. He had taken his own life, after a painful 11 year battle with bipolar disorder and depression. My stepmom also passed away from cancer the following year. It was just one of those times where everything feels so surreal, that your mind keeps trying to convince you that it was all a dream. Such an awful feeling. One which is much worse than any fear or pain that I've ever experienced. I didn't feel like I could bear it forever, and at that point I truly did not want to live anymore. Eventually, I started having these dreams, after my stepmother had passed, of a dark hole. I couldn't see anything, but I could tell that I was falling. I was afraid to stop myself, yet the longer I fell, the more scared I became. I couldn't take it anymore. I really wanted to die. But there was that feeling again. Someone was watching over me, but this time it didn't feel sad. It was as if it was letting me know that I was safe. I would then suddenly feel myself laying down, with sunlight beaming down on my face, although I still could not see anything. I would always wake up shortly after this, alone in my room once again. The world didn't stop to wait for me while I was falling to pieces. Everyone was moving on without me, but I learned to enjoy the feeling of being left behind, because it was a strangely comforting feeling that made it easier to fade away from reality. However, I didn't fade away like everyone else did at the time. I probably would have though, and I would likely not be here today if I was left alone much longer. But something happened that changed my life forever. Something that reminds me that we are never truly alone, no matter how painfully alone we may feel at times. I had one final dream, about a month before my 18th birthday, which makes me smile every time I think about it. I remember being on all fours, struggling to push back on an immense force that was trying to bury me into the ground. I was calling out for help, but no one was around to hear my trembling voice. I tried so hard, and for so long to keep this force at bay. But finally, I realized that I could not win this battle. I surrendered to the feeling, 
and let myself fall onto the ground. The cold dirt began to swallow me whole, pulling me deep into the earth. I closed my eyes and sobbed softly as I breathed my last breath. I was no longer afraid, and I was ready to die. A sensation then gently washed over me, and my whole body began to tingle. Something eventually told me to open my eyes, and when I did, I was sitting on the edge of a pier, looking out at this beautiful orange sky. After a few moments, I turned to the left of me, and there she was, my sweetest friend. She smiled innocently as I looked right through her. No words were spoken. We just looked into each other's eyes, and then gazed out at the sunset together. Ali used to sometimes tell me how much she wanted to go to the beach, yet she had never been, and now I was right there with her. I could hear the waves crashing against the supports underneath the pier, and I could feel the gentle breeze caress my cheek. This was by far the most beautiful moment I've ever experienced in my life. I felt a calming warmth in my chest, and I turned to tell Ali that I loved her. But before I could speak, she leaned over and wrapped her arms around me. She held me so tightly, and I started to shed tears of joy, sadness, and confusion all at the same time. Finally, she spoke softly in my ear, in her sweet, familiar voice. She told me that it was time for her to go. And then she said something that has stayed with me in my mind ever since that day. We are always here, she said. Close your eyes, and we are there with you. Always. When I opened my eyes, she was gone, and I sat there alone on the pier for a while longer, not really thinking about anything, until I awoke in my bedroom. And that was the end of it. I've never had anything strange like that happen to me since then, and I honestly don't think I ever will again. Whatever that creature was in the first three dreams, it was definitely not some kind of spiritual representation of my friend Ali. It was something else altogether. Maybe it was an angel of some sort. I don't think I'll ever know for sure, but it was more than just a figment of my imagination. It foreshadowed the worst year of my life, and it made predictions which later came true. I'm pretty clueless as to what its intentions were, but it didn't feel threatening in any way. This, whatever it was, had a deep connection with me. It felt sort of like a mother looking after her child. I like to believe that it was a guardian angel or something of the like, and it understood exactly what I was going through. As I said before, I am not a religious person. However, my gut feeling told me that whatever that being was is far beyond our human understanding. I believe that it came from whatever plane of existence is patiently waiting for us after this life. I have since moved to California, where I sometimes drive to the beach and head to the pier around sunset. It makes me feel closer to not only Ali, but also to all the others that I've lost over the years. When you lose someone who you truly love with all your heart, it forms a wound that can never truly heal. Sure, we all have to get on with our lives at some point, and memories of our loved ones inevitably begin to fade over time. But when you care about someone deeply, you form a powerful connection with that person, one that we often don't notice until they're gone. I know in my heart of hearts that this truly indescribable feeling is simply too strong to break, and not even death can silence the bond I have with those I've lost. We all have that one memory that burns, yet we can't seem to let go of it. This is mine, and it saved my life. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget that you can enjoy full episodes of Real Paranormal Stories by visiting the playlist. You can also read paranormal testimonies and more on our website, paranormalscholar.com. Remember, the more you know, the more there is to fear. <laughs>